So remember all who have died during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to help us process uh, these two major events in American and New York City life and to help us think through grief about a variety of subjects. We are uh, honored to welcome Dorothy P. Hollinger, PhD. She was an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School for over 23 years. She now serves as psychologist in the Department of Neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a Harvard teaching hospital, and as an affiliate member of the Psychiatry Neuroimaging Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She is a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and has her own psychotherapy practice as well. She is also the author of The Anatomy of Grief about which she'll be speaking today. And Yale University Press, her publisher has uh, kindly enough uh, offered a discount for everyone who is attending today's forum. We have a flyer with information about that discount uh, linked in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollinger for being with us. We are looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Peter. So uh, I think we're ready now for you to share your screen and, and go ahead with the presentation. Afterwards, we'll have time for a few questions. And I can see your screen okay, Dr. Holland. There we go. Great. Okay, yes. You can see me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with all of you, remote though it is. For me, it's an honor and a privilege to deliver the forum talk today. The book I've written, The Anatomy of Grief, was released last September, well after COVID-19 had erupted and turned grief into a household word. For all of you who have suffered losses on 9-11 and more recently during the pandemic, Grief, sorrow, and anguish are familiar acquaintances, I'm sure. Today, we're here to remember those who died on September 11th, 2001, and those who have died during the COVID pandemic that began over 18 months ago. I speak to all of you, the bereaved of 9-11 and the bereaved of the pandemic. And I also speak to the survivors and the responders of both of these disasters 9-11 and the pandemic. I'm here to tell you some things about grief, about memory and memorials. But before I begin, um, please be warned that some of the in images and content and what I will say may be triggering for some people. Yesterday marked the 20th anniversary of that tragic day, September 11th, 2001. The word disaster means great damage and injury that can happen suddenly, often without warning. The word is used for accidents, car wrecks, fires, and robberies. But what meaning does that word disaster have for 9-11? Can one truly fathom the extent of the damage that happened from that disaster? No. The long planned coordinated attack on American soil was one of unequal dimension. It was catastrophic. 19 terrorists in all attacked a symbol of America's economic and global power, the Twin Towers, and attacked the site of our US military headquarters, the Pentagon. The third potential attack thought to be targeting the US Capitol didn't happen because of the heroic actions of the passengers aboard Flight 93 who forced the plane to crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. In 2021, we've been living in a biological disaster that has affected and infected the health of our nation and has spread throughout the world. COVID-19, it hit us like a sledgehammer. And it wasn't only that we didn't see it coming, this virus was something we never could have imagined. It has been described as the worst human crisis since the Second World War. COVID-19 attacked us when the year 2020 began. Let's return to 9-11. Today, we mourn and rem we remember those we lost two decades ago. Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, wives, husbands, life partners, and even children, eight died 
their ages ranging from two to 11. In New York City, the World Trade Center was hit. Flight 11 hit the North Tower. Flight 175 hit the South Tower. Both towers collapsed. And two nearby buildings also collapsed. The Marriott Hotel at Three World Trade Center and the building at Seven World Trade Center. In Arlington, Virginia, Flight 77 hit the west side of the Pentagon. In Shanksville, Pennsylvania, Flight 93 crashed into a field, prevented from reaching probably the capital by the passengers on board. First responders, you're trained to respond to emergency situations that require quick and experienced reactions from those prepared for disaster. But what happened on 9-11 was profoundly different. Nothing like this was anything that they were, had been trained for. The bravest, they rushed to the emergency calls and 340 of them were killed. The finest rushed to the scene 72 police officers were killed. Beyond 9-11's first responders who were killed, thousands of them were injured and over 1,100 have been diagnosed with cancer directly linked to the dust and toxic air and the toll still grows. After the attack, many hundreds of people were listed as missing. Family, friends and colleagues posted messages and kept checking for news at the wall of missing persons. There are over 1,000 victims whose bodies are not accounted for at the World Trade Center. A year and a half ago, on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. Two days later, on March 13th, 2020, the U.S. declared two national emergency declarations. Ten days later, a nationwide lockdown was put into place. That was 18 months ago, during the first wave of the pandemic. On May 23rd, 2021, four months ago, the lockdown was lifted. When COVID-19 began to spread and people began dying, responders came forward, first responders, medical teams, and funeral teams. You know, when we hear sirens, we know the first responders, firefighters, and EMTs are on their way to an emergency. Their words, their tone of voice, just their presence can calm the stricken victims in the midst of chaos and fear. The EMT first responders at the emergency assess the medical situation, often beginning medical treatment for the patient in, different, in distress before hospital teams take over. In hospitals, access to the sick and dying, it was different when COVID-19 hit. It was different for patients and the staff. So many died alone without family who were prevented from being there because of the risk of infection. The tragedy was twofold, not only dying, but dying alone without family. But often a doctor, a nurse, or another hospital worker would hold up an iPhone, allowing a patient and their family to say a virtual goodbye to each other. And there were the essential workers who were there after patients died, the funeral directors and mortuary workers who took care of the bodies of cherished mothers, fathers, children, brothers, sisters and life partners. As of September 11th, yesterday, 677,731 patients have died from the virus. We felt grief and like the virus, it was new. This new form of grief, pandemic grief, affected us in ways that are unique to this time. We grieved not only together with family and friends, we grieved the loss of not being able to use each other's face without a mask. We grieved not being able to hug each other or even shake hands. And last September, I wrote an essay about pandemic grief. It described the loss of community and the many things that made up the lives we lived before the virus struck. <clears throat> 
But we felt more than the pandemic grief that each of us experienced as individuals. As a nation, we grieve the many hundreds of thousands of those lost to COVID. And last February, I wrote an op-ed piece titled The Collective Grief We Must Face. The essay described how we as Americans grieved collectively on a national scale for all those who died of the virus. The op-ed was published in The Hill on the same day that President Biden and Vice President Harris honored those who died from COVID in a ceremony at the Reflecting Pool in DC. The essay described how art can help our collective grief. The photo shows how the memorial service used the beauty of the setting to help us process enormous human suffering. Each of the 400 lights that rimmed the pool represented a thousand victims of the virus. But the collective grief after 9-11, we were shocked, all of us shaken to the core. Our senses flooded with horror and disbelief. That time during and after the attack, in the midst of the wreckage and the search for victims, we joined one another in a collective grief that's also been called a collective trauma. And this is what pulled us together as Americans. We mourn those who were lost on 9-11. Our expressions of grief include the, this art installation, Tribute and Light. It began as a temporary commemoration of the attacks in early 2002. But since then, Tribute and Light has become an annual event produced each December 11th by the Municipal Arts Society of New York. And as we grieve on an individual and a national scale, the sorrow connects us all. We're a country made up of diverse people and different religions. The funeral rites and mortuary practices that are used to care for the deceased depend upon our faith. But whatever faith we practice after a loved one dies, we all experience the universal sadness of grief. And grief is what my book is about. Grief is the sorrow we feel after a loved one dies. It's inextricably bound to love and looms as large as the loved one we lost. Grief is the price we pay for love. I've experienced grief since I was a child. Those experiences and knowledge, my research on the brain and on grief, my patients, all guided me in writing this book. The anatomy of grief describes what happens to the bereaved after a loved one dies, the ways that grief affects the entire human self, how the brain is grief stricken, the heart is breaking and the body hurts. Um, in this table of contents for the book, the chapters highlighted in color are ones I'll touch on briefly. I'll begin with forms of grief that are especially relevant to 9-11 and the pandemic. And then I'll briefly describe the brain, the heart, and the body. And lastly, I'll touch on the grief that affects the bereaved based on the relationship they had with the deceased. Grief is like a chameleon. It's changeable and it comes in different forms. And it also has its own schedule that is different for every griever. It can surge and recede and bubble up again at unexpected times or at an anniversary of the date of a death and like today, like 9-11. The forms of grief described here and in my book don't belong to any diagnostic disorder like those described in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association. The forms I described are meant to be explanatory ter terms that come from those used by clinicians, research journals, and books on grief. Anticipatory grief during the pandemic when family, families were unsure if a hospitalized loved one would die of the virus. Ambiguous grief when families didn't know if a loved one had died during 9-11. Traumatic grief. Grief and PTSD have sometimes been linked together and referred to as traumatic grief. What this means is that grief and trauma can coexist. Usually, often in therapy, each is addressed separately, beginning with trauma. And PTSD, 
After 9-11, researchers found that New Yorkers responded to this tragedy with surprising resilience. And it may have been linked to their shared experience of collective grief and trauma. Survivor guilt. It can be the feeling of guilt from having survived 9-11 or even the COVID pandemic. And postponed grief. This is what the bereaved felt because they couldn't be with a, a dying loved one or even experience the closure of traditional funerals. New grief experienced by the bereaved can be acute, appearing during, right after a, a crisis or even later. Physical distress, distress can be experienced coming in waves with shortness of breath, tightness in the throat and feeling faint. These physical symptoms are accompanied by intense mental and emotional distress. But later grief can't be controlled or predicted. It can change or overlap with other forms of grief. But what about the brain? Over 2,000 years ago, grief, like all our other emotion, comes from the brain. I want to point out that this is the outer layer. This is the cortex of the brain. Under the cortex, the limbic system is a set of brain regions that are on the left as well as the right side of the, of the brain. The amygdala in red here is important in survival behaviors. The hippocampus, right in back of it, creates long-term memories. The hypothalamus here controls stress and the physical changes in the body, such as heart rate, sweating, feeling, faint, and more. And the cingulate gyrus, or the cingulate cortex, it's also called, regulates focus and attention. And because these brain areas respond to feelings such as fear, anxiety, and grief, the limbic system is often called the emotional brain. But the amygdala, it's the brain region that raises the alarm fight, flight, or freeze in animals in response to a threatening stimulus. In humans, the amygdala is activated when we're experiencing overwhelming emotions such as anger, sadness, and grief. For the bereaved, for survivors, for responders, and for all of us, there are ways to reduce the intensity of overwhelming feelings. This part of the brain, we're back to the cortex, the outer layer, this part, it's called the prefrontal cortex. And because it's where planning and thinking happen, it's often called the thinking brain. Research shows that when negative, negative emotions are labeled, put into words, brain activity changes from the amygdala, which you saw is underneath the cortex, up to the right prefrontal cortex. So putting where thinking happens, where think, Putting sadness and sorrow into words is a way to manage the intensity of grief. Talking about the one we lost can be extremely helpful. We say it's with the brain we know, but it's with the heart we feel. Can a heart break from grief? Yes, both metaphorically and physically. My heart is breaking, some say. And physically, acute grief can result in a rare condition called broken heart syndrome. It was first described in Japan in 1990 as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy because the lower left ventricle of the heart balloons out and it can look like a Takotsubo, which is a Japanese octopus trapping pot that has a wide bottom and a narrow neck. But I want to stress that broken heart syndrome is rare and is usually reversible within weeks and without any long-term effects. There's no doubt after the death of a loved one, we're flooded with sadness. Feelings of loss can seem unbearable. Sleeping, eating, living, everything is different. Words are not the only way we express our grief. Tears also do. But they're not all the same. There are three kinds, basal, reactive, and emotional. Basal tears moisten the eyes. Reactive tears clear in air tents from the eyes. And when someone feels the sadness of grief and cries, these are emotional tears. And they have a chemical called leucine and kephalin in them. And enkephalin is related to endorphins. So part of the reason we feel better after crying is the effect of the enkephalin. 
While there are different kinds of tears, there are also different patterns in tears that are caused by different emotions, such as grief. Shapes of tears were photographed by Rosalind Fisher. She dropped tears from many different emotions onto slides, let them dry, put them under a microscope and photograph them. And this slide shows tears of grief. By the way, she clearly states her images were not a controlled scientific study. Here you see tears of change. The lost loved ones from 9-11 and the pandemic. Mothers, fathers, children, siblings, and life partners. The grief we feel depends to a great extent upon our relationship with the deceased. What are mothers? Is motherness a word? The essence that embodies a relationship with our mother is impossible to describe. After birth, a baby listens, stares at, and smells the unique scent of, scent of mother while cradled in her arms. No matter the relationship later, a mother's patient, a mother's pre presence like air can seem imperceptible. Even if one's relationship with one's mother didn't begin at birth, but at adoption, or even if the mother-child relationship is estranged, mother is there until she dies. And a father, what effect does his death have on a son or daughter? In her book, H is for Hawk, Helen McDonald describes her intense grief after her father died. She writes that while she had no patience with her grief, time passed all the same and worked as careful, ma careful magic. Her grief turned into something different. She writes, what I felt was simply love. I'm gonna describe a patient of mine, Miss K. She began therapy because she was feeling depressed and thought it was because she had recently retired. In therapy, she was able to access her delayed grief that was caused by the death of her baby 20 years before. Baby Angela died at nine months after a series of cardiac surgeries. My patient's grief was delayed and postponed because of life's circumstances. She'd had a son a year after the death of Angela and went back to work full time when she started school, when he started school. 20 years later, Miss K had the time and the emotional space needed for her delayed grief to be fully felt. After the death of a sister or a brother within the immediate family, the grief is often the least acknowledged of bereavements. Friends and relatives tend to focus their sympathy on parents and siblings, not siblings. This form of grief is called disenfranchised grief. Yet a sibling feels intense pain when a sibling bond is broken by death. They suffer the ache of missing the brother or the sister who shared growing up with them. The grief after losing the spouse or significant other can be crushing. The countless shared experiences, joking, laughing, kissing, all screeches to a halt. I lost my wife, the widower's words. I lost my husband, the widow's. Four words that fit heartbreak into one sentence. For life partners who are unmarried, there are no identifying words that tell the death of a beloved partner. Yet their life too has irrevocably changed. All who were killed in the attacks on 9-11, the airline passengers and crew, the people inside the World Trade Center in nearby areas, those in the Pentagon and those on Flight 93. Art has been expressed going back tens of thousands of years and many, many memorials have been built in remembrance of the dead. Art will help us to express our grief. I wrote that in the op-ed piece. And these poignant memorials like this one help us process and contextualize our pain the way this memorial in 9-11 in New York City has helped us honor and remember the victims who died on September 11th, 2001. The stark beauty of the 9-11 memorial inside the Pentagon grounds with 184 empty benches is called America's Heroes Memorial. It's located in the outermost ring, the ring known as the E-ring of the Pentagon. 
and this location is at the plane's point of impact. At the Flight 93 National Memorial, there are 40 panels of polished white granite, eight feet tall, each inscribed with the name of the 40 heroes. There were children who lost fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles, and other relatives. And there were a hundred or more babies born after their fathers died on September 11th. Those children have grown up. Today, those children are young adults and adults whose childhood was filled with the tragic legacy of 9-11 and what it took from them. The loss of a loved one has become part of their identity. For many, it has made them stronger. And for some, it's a challenge that continues. And now today, we're all faced with the challenge of the COVID pandemic. And it seems like it will never end. The world we're living in, the pandemic. As I said before, yesterday, September 11th, that is the death toll in the United States. Here in the United States, our collective grief resulted in a communal angst for all of those who died of COVID, who died not only here, but abroad as well. For many of us have family in other countries. This is a global this catastrophe. And last May, the breakdown when it was lifted, we were beginning to heal as individuals and as a nation. We were thanking those who helped during the pandemic, especially healthcare and hospital workers, heroes who cared for patients with the virus. And then Delta hit us, the Delta variant. variant. COVID was fading, we were fe feeling freer, taking off our masks, getting together with family and friends. But this Delta variant is more contagious than COVID-19. So now we're putting back our masks and we continue to practice social distancing and hand, hand hygiene. The continuation is hard on everyone, but especially on the first responders and healthcare workers. Throughout the nation, nurses, residents, doctors, and all other hospital staff have taken care of patients with COVID. Some they saved, but many, many died and healthcare workers grieve those lives as more patients continue to be admitted. I wrote an essay about their pain and I wrote it last year, September 3rd, 2020. The essay is even more relevant today than it was last year. It describes what has happened to some of our first responders and our healthcare workers. Because of their continued work with trauma, the exposures to people suffering and dying Many people have experienced what is called vicarious trauma. This is a condition where there is a disruption of spirituality or when life loses meaning and hope. And now our first responders are again being called on, but it's different. It's different now than at the beginning of the pandemic. They're fatigued and discouraged. Many have retired, resigned or quit because the stress and the anguish became overwhelming. And many have died. An essay in the New York Times of August 16th noted that over 1,140 nurses in the US have died during, died caring for COVID patients. Many responders have been traumatized by helping others by what happened on their watch by the patients and disaster victims they couldn't save. And while they're dedicated and resilient, what about them? Yes, responding to disasters, what they do, what they're trained to do. But what about their mental health? What about vicarious trauma? What can happen because of the relentlessness of dealing with the trauma of victims and survivors? It takes a toll. While many of you may know this information, it may be helpful to others. So I'll pause just a few seconds here. Therapy, um, I'd like to mention, for many can help deal with the continued experience of being a responder. 
first responders, healthcare workers, and essential workers, and also for survivors, for the bereaved, and for all of us. To talk with a professional may be indicated and can help. Here's another image of tears, tears of change. For all of us to remember that crying is okay, it helps. It's the encephalin and emotional tears that make us feel better. So please remember it is okay to cry, not just for women, but also for men. A letter to the editor in the New York Times yesterday from Jim Fisher, who wrote, how did 9-11 affect me directly? I cry a lot easier now. We remember the victims of the 9-11 attacks, especially over the past few days when we've grieved, when we've remembered and we've cried. Those who died and disappeared that fateful day, they were our mothers, our uncles, fathers, siblings, life partners, and the children. We remember them. And we continue to heal as we re remember the wonder of the people whose lives we lost on 9-11. We've seen the memorials erected to honor our loved ones, those we lost that fateful day. We visit them and continue to remember those who died 20 years ago. But meanwhile, our lives go on, pushed forward by time. Today, where do we find ourselves 18 months after the start of this pandemic, now that pandemic cases are increasing? In the op-ed piece, I suggested a memorial or a National Day of Remembrance for the pandemic. And on July 31st, last July, a contingent of bereaved citizens went to Congress to ask for such a day. And now grief has its own schedule and grief is different for everyone. It can surge and recede and bubble up again at unexpected times. Sorrow returns when there's an anniversary like yesterday and any other one. Grief eventually does ease and quiets as memories emerge, loving, calming. <laughs> Interesting slip, calming. Loving, comic, and perhaps silly. Sometimes those memories when they pop up are bitter, sweet, and loving, but they can help sustain and enrich the life of the bereaved. We've gone through powerful and tragic experiences, 9-11 and during the pandemic. The bereaved, the survivors, all the responders and all of us, and we're still battling the virus, a variant of it, Delta. But hope, resilience and faith for us are mainstays, they're our mainstays. Life pushes us forward after loss. And as you can read in this slide, crisis can create growth. The saying, knowledge itself is power, is attributed to Sir Francis Bacon. This image here, research holding the truth of knowledge is one of the bronze doors at the entrance to the Library of Congress. The figure represents research shedding light on what we don't know. She, research, gives us the power to change lives, ours and others. Knowledge of grief and the effects of grief can help you grieve and help you grow. Putting grief into words, talking with others, naming what was unsaid and unknown is a key to knowledge. To learn more, to seek and gain knowledge creates more options that can improve our quality of life and make it better. I end the talk with these thoughts. Life can be enjoyed again after the death of a loved one. 20 years after 9-11 and 18 months after the isolation and pain of the pandemic, we're gathered here today to honor those we lost and remember them with memorials, with art and with our own memories of them that are, delight, that are delightful, loving and joyful. And as we, remember, as we remember how those lost loved ones enriched our lives, let's internalize the knowledge that it is possible for life to be enjoyed again. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollinger. We do have some time for questions. I encourage those of you who have questions to use the live chat function on YouTube, the comments function on Facebook, or you can email me pthompson at stbarts.org. That's P-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N 
at stbarts.org. Uh, those of you who are in our in-person audience, you can also submit a written question to my colleague, Manny Rodriguez Leach, and he will make sure that I get it. Dr. Hollinger, uh, you mentioned that you've experienced grief for, for most of your life. I'm, I'm curious where your professional interest in grief uh, came from and uh, why you first chose to focus on grief specifically. Um, well, the grief um, that I experienced myself, which I write about in the book, um, my sister died when she was three months old and I was a toddler. And uh, my mother really never really grieved that loss. Uh, it's another form of grief, which is chronic grief. And um, I pretty much felt that throughout my life with her and also in the family. Um, they didn't grieve the lost loved ones. So it was rather a natural when I was in um, graduate school, what happened is, um, this was during my doctoral training, what happened was I was in a research group with um, an, in, uh, an investigator who was researching grief. And um, so I began talking to people who had lost people, had lost loved ones, and, you know, we did the research on them. And and it didn't just end there, which was amazing. When I was um, doing my internship uh, in the hospital on an inpatient unit, my very first patient was somebody that was hospitalized with intense depression. And what that depression um, covered that we described very shortly afterwards, after his uh, hospitalization was grief. And he hadn't processed because he couldn't. Um, his mother who died when he was nine, his father who died when he was an adult, and then his brother who died um, shortly before his hospitalization, which really, I think, put him over the edge in terms of being able to, to, um, to actually live. Um, he was a farmer, actually, and he just absolutely stopped doing anything. So it was this uh, was a combination of all those experiences that um, I think got me here. I began researching the brain also and wondered how it went together, grief and the brain. And so, um, so maybe that's too long. <laughs> no, that's, that's just fine. Um, one of, one of our audience members writes that he was an EMT and responded the morning of September 11th, worked the site for two days uh, he describes the experience as life-changing and says that mourning together is healing. Mourning alone is destructive. Let us all mourn together. Yes. Um, and, and along those lines, I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a, a little more about collective grief. Um, we now in the 20 years uh, um, since 9-11, uh, there are now children who have been born since that day who don't mm -hmm. remember that day. Uh, some of those folks are actually now adults. Um, can they share in this collective grief? Um, does grief kind of transfer from generation to generation? Uh, curious your thoughts about that. You know, that's an interesting point. Um, there is something called generational repetition that you sometimes see in families in terms of um, some kind of a quality that's handed down, that is almost handed down, um, if not it was modeled for, um, and someone in the family just begins behaving that way. But the collective grief, you know, I think this, what happened on 9-11, um, it simply will never leave us. Uh, you know, I must say it's coming back to me, but when I was preparing this talk, sometimes it was very difficult and it wasn't about pandemic grief or my own grief, but it was about 9-11. And I think it's something that actually unites us all and puts us in a place where we all can connect with each other, I guess, spiritually, Peter, yes, um, spiritually in a way that I don't think anything else that we've experienced in our lifetimes uh, that we've, that would do it for us the way 9-11 brings us together. 
and I want to thank that EMT. Um, you know, I didn't put any images up of some of those terrible images um, that people <laughs> not saw, but experienced during 9-11 and of the survivors running away. Um, I mean, it was just, we're all in this and I think we're all together. And maybe it's a day when we can say we as Americans, we're together. We share this. What differences do you see, you know, maybe especially as a clinician in the, in the grief that was experienced post 9-11 and the grief that is experienced during COVID? It's, it seems as if 9-11 yeah. was something everyone acknowledged and yet yes. we're, at, we're all at very different levels when it comes to COVID. It's very present for some people. Some people almost seek to ignore and, and deny it. Um, what, what insights can we derive from comparing the two kinds of grief? Um, you know, what I said, I think is relevant with 9-11, but for the pandemic, uh, Peter, what you just said about um, ignoring it, one of my patients had a sister who died during COVID um, and it wasn't of COVID, it was something else. And she said to me, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, I feel numb. I can't, I, I don't feel any grief. And I think this is part of what I described in that slide about postponed or delayed grief. And we talked about how, because they couldn't have a traditional funeral, which is when people actually confront the deceased um, and begin to realize that they're gone. Um, virtual funerals just didn't do it. I mean, it's, it's not a good analogy, but it's the only one I can think of. It's like watching television. It's, it just does, didn't do it. I mean, some people do, it did help, um, but it's not like a traditional funeral where you're together with family and friends and you hold each other, you cry together. So, and, and I guess you grieve, you can grieve together physically. You know, you were there with each other and it was just very different. Uh, and I think we're going to be experiencing um, some effects of this after this is over. Um, so. I, I know you write that your book is, is descriptive, not prescriptive, but I, I wonder, uh, you know, we all will grieve at points in our lives. Most of us have already grieved yeah. at some point in our lives so far. Um, what, what advice do you have for those who grieve? Um, what you, you uh, counsel and, are, and treat people who grieve regularly, what's the, what should we do as we're grieving to, to help ourselves get through that process better? It's a wonderful question. Um, first, um, not to be afraid of your, the grief you're feeling, not to be um, overwhelmed by intense feelings um, and to name them, to be able to put words on them. And, you know, I must point out that the stronger the feeling, the harder it is to find words for them. So it takes a little bit of doing, but also to be able to talk about the loved one um, to family and friends. I've had friends and colleagues and patients say, you know, I can't, nobody wants to talk about whoever it is that died. And it's really hard for me. And you know, the bereaved sometimes feel as though they don't wanna hurt other people's feelings. Well, they're hurting. And a way to maybe introduce it is, you know, this may be difficult for you, but I need to talk about whoever it is. So to talk about it and um, talk about it, uh, I guess <laughs> since, what I do is talking, talk therapy. <laughs> um, talking is just so important and um, it can really help. But also to be able to know that grief will calm. Um, it doesn't stay at that intensity. And also not to be surprised when it pops up sometimes, um, some unforeseen stimulus, like um, a movie you've gone to and, 
the man in the movie, uh, the main character, one of my patients said that when she got outside, she just started crying and crying and realized it wasn't actually until we talked that it was the man reminded her of her, of her father and her father's, the loss of her father just popped up like that. And I'm guessing that those of us who support those who grieve should also not be afraid of grief and should, should yeah. do our best to, to listen and talk with them about the loved one they lost. Yeah, that's absolutely beautifully put, Peter, because listening is hard. Listening for the listener is hard sometimes. And, you know, sometimes any of us, all of us want to kind of push it away and, okay, what's the next topic? But yes to listen, to be the empathic listener that I'm sure you are. Well, Dr. Hollinger, unfortunately, we need to leave it there this morning. We're so grateful for the time you have spent with us uh, in, in helping to process our grief over mm -hmm. these two big events in American history and for helping us think about grief in general. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Peter. It was wonderful. Bye-bye. Thank you all for watching. We uh, do encourage you to stick around and join us for worship at 11 a.m. Today's uh, service will be in remembrance of all who died on September 11th, 2001, and uh, for those who have died during the COVID-19 pandemic. Take care, all. <laughs>